Join me tomorrow night live on Twitch and YouTube at 9 p.m. Eastern, where we will play live NFL trivia for cash prizes. Link to play below. And now, on with our feature presentation. The Miami Dolphins in the pre-Don Shula years might have been the biggest laughing stock in all of sports, as they were such a poor team on the field and were so poorly run off the field that they truly had no idea what they were doing. Thank God that Don Shula eventually came in and righted the ship. Because the number of stories from the 1960s involving the Dolphins and their dysfunction are absolutely insane. To the point where I could spend an entire season just talking about crazy incidents that happened under head coach George Wilson if I really wanted to. From the fact that George Wilson had his son be the team's quarterback, only for owner Joe Robbie to mandate after one year that he could no longer do that, to the scheduling feud with the Orange Bowl that turned every single high school football team in the area against the Dolphins, to one of my personal favorites, the time in 1968 where the Dolphins played a game against the Houston Oilers, and the entire field was covered in paper because some teenager brought a phone book into the stadium and he just ripped up all the pages and threw them onto the field and no one saw it, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, the Dolphins were an absolute catastrophe in every sense of the word and were the laughing stock of the AFL for good reason. There aren't a whole lot of crazy, wacky, and funny stories about the Dolphins being mismanaged in the 1970s. But in the 1960s, man, there was one just about every single week that will make you scratch your head and make you wonder how the heck this team, just a few years later, became one of the best and most stable in all of football. And this story that we're going to talk about today is no exception. Because this man right here, number 32, is a running back by the name of Joe Auer. Before the Dolphins had one of the greatest backfields of all time, and had an absolutely amazing three-headed monster with Larry Zaka, Jim Kick, and Mercury Morris, they had this guy right here. His career with Miami was notable for a few reasons, which we'll get to in a bit. But perhaps the craziest part of his career was how he left the team. Because while there are some departures that are graceful, that are done with class, and that are done with no hard feelings whatsoever, there are some, like Joe Hours, that are the exact opposite of that, where Hours tried to literally blackmail the team into giving him money on his way out. It's a bizarre saga that you probably never heard of, but it's one that, more than half a century later, deserves a deep dive. Because this is the story behind one of the craziest blackmail incidents in the history of professional football. Before I talk about what exactly Auer did that was absolutely insane and defied all logic, where he tried to blackmail an entire football team, we need some context to understand just who Joe Auer was and why he was even cut in the first place. If you've ever heard of the name Joe Auer before this, odds are, it's because he's the answer to a neat little trivia question. Who scored the first touchdown in Dolphins history? Well, that's none other than Joe Auer, who took the opening kickoff of their Week 1 game against the Oakland Raiders 95 yards to the house for the score, meaning that thanks to Auer, literally the very first play in Dolphins history much like the Saints one year later, was a touchdown. And aside from the kickoff return for a score, Auer was the marquee man for the Dolphins in 1966, as he was the guy that most fans identified with due to how often he touched the ball and how often he found the end zone. It's not a surprise, seeing as they were an expansion team in their first season, that the Dolphins were a mess in 1966 going 3-11 and finishing tied with the Houston Oilers for the worst record in the AFL. However, if there was one bright spot, it was the play of Joe Auer, who spent the previous two seasons with the rival Buffalo Bills. In 1966, for all intents and purposes, Joe Auer was the offense. 
He led the team with 416 rushing yards. No other player on the Dolphins had 300. He led the team with four rushing touchdowns. Combined, every other player on the team had one. He led the team with four receiving touchdowns. No other player on the team had more than two. He scored eight of Miami's 21 offensive touchdowns, meaning that if you were to pick a random touchdown from 1966 that the Dolphins scored on offense, there was a 38% chance that it was Auer who was the one to score. For some perspective on how insane that is, in terms of percentage of offensive touchdowns responsible for, that was, by far, the top percentage in the league. Which speaks to not just how good Joe Auer was, but how bad the rest of the Dolphins' offense was as well. The closest player to Auer was Lance Allworth of the San Diego Chargers, the eventual Hall of Fame wide receiver who scored 13 of the team's 38 touchdowns, which comes out to over 34% but is still well behind Joe Auer. Keep in mind that no other player on the Dolphins had more than two touchdowns all season. He led the team with 143 touches. No other player on the team even so much as touched 90, let alone 100. And he led the team with 679 yards from scrimmage, which was nearly 200 yards above Bo Robertson for the most on the team. Long story short, Joe Auer, with nine touchdowns if we count the one kickoff return touchdown, four rushing touchdowns, and four receiving touchdowns, was sixth in the league in total touchdowns. That was really good, seeing as he also finished the year second in the league in all-purpose yards, only 85 yards behind Jim Nance of the Boston Patriots for the AFL lead. Again, Auer was an instrumental part of the team's offense in 1966, so much so that he was named a unanimous choice for the team's MVP, and was maybe the first star player on the Miami Dolphins, on a team that, let's be honest, didn't have many starting out. However, after a pretty good 1966 season, and after looking like he could possibly be a key part of the Dolphins' offense going forward, things sort of went south shortly after. In 1967, he lost playing time to guys like Stan Mitchell, Admiral Haynes, and Sammy Price, as he only finished the season with 128 rushing yards and three total touchdowns, meaning he scored just one-third of the time he did in 1966 and had about one-third of the rushing yards as well. He averaged a mere 2.9 yards per carry, which was by far the worst total on the team amongst all players to have at least double-digit rushing attempts. And whereas he led the team in yards from scrimmage in 1966 and in rushing yards, he finished sixth in both of those categories in 1967. He was buried. In 1966, George Auer was the most important part of an otherwise sputtering offense. In 1967, he was absolutely expendable, especially after he got in the doghouse of the coaching staff and this man right here head coach George Wilson for his efforts on special teams, where in an embarrassing 29-7 loss on the road against the New York Jets, he not only muffed a punt return in the second quarter, but after the game, asked assistant coach John Idzik to take him off of the special teams. At that point, in the eyes of George Wilson, there was no going back. Said head coach George Wilson on hour and his attitude, essentially booking him a one-way ticket to irrelevance and the bench, let's get one thing straight. Joe asked for this. I don't intend to have any player making a full guy of a coach. I can understand he was unhappy over being benched after dropping a punt, and I know he has an unusual personality. But I've never heard of a good pro athlete who wants to be taken out of a game. If he wants bench time, he'll get it. I know Auer can break up a ball game for you, and I know what he's done for us in the past. I was as glad as anybody when he got the most valuable player award last year. But pro football is a game of here and now, and not yesterday. And Joe has been making mistakes. Sometimes, 
He seems to be in a daze out there. I will not tolerate his reaction. I realize Joe is a very popular player in Miami, but I'm still running this team, not Joe. And I'll decide who plays football and when. And as we're about to find out, this would not be the last time that Auer and Wilson would feud. Because with the writing on the wall for this man right here, Joe Auer, especially when the Dolphins added not one, but two talented runners in Larry Zaka and Jim Kick at the 1968 draft, the former of which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, Joe Auer, just a year removed from being the hero of the team, would be on his way out. He was placed on waivers after getting injured in a traffic accident, as he and Larry Zonka were driving when Auer's dune buggy flipped over after going 30 miles per hour after Auer tried to swerve to avoid hitting a possum. Said Auer, the side of my face and my shoulder are raw where I hit the cement. Both cuts are where my equipment would irritate them. So you had a player who couldn't play. A player who had an attitude problem and wound up in Wilson's doghouse. A player who was struggling. And a player who was now buried on the depth chart. Yeah, no wonder he was cut by the team. But still, even despite all of that, George Wilson, recognizing the talent that Auer had, wanted to keep him around on the taxi squad and keep him as an extra number. But Auer didn't want to sign with Miami's taxi squad, seeing as he didn't get along with Wilson, and seeing as he felt he could get playing time elsewhere, mainly with the Atlanta Falcons, a team that finished in the bottom half of the NFL in 1967 in every rushing category, including dead last in rushing touchdowns, and a team that, with the exception of Junior Coffey, didn't have a single player run for at least 150 yards all season. With that, Auer signed with the Falcons on their active roster and left the Dolphins behind. And let's be honest, as bizarre as Joe Auer's career was with Miami, and as bizarre of a fall from grace as that was, if that was all that happened, this wouldn't be too much of a story. However, that's where you'd be wrong. Oh man, would you be wrong. Because what's the holy grail of every team? What is the biggest physical object of the success of a team and its game plan on any given week? Where, if you have it in your possession, you might as well have just won the game and exposed all of their secrets. That's right, the playbook. The glorious, glorious playbook. The last thing any team wants especially if you're playing that team in a game, is for the playbook to be seen by the opposition, so that the opposition knows all of your plays, knows all of your routes, knows all of your tendencies, knows all of your signals, knows all of your assignments, and knows exactly what you're going to be doing. There's a reason that any time a player gets cut, the first thing that is said to them is to bring their playbook over so they can turn it in. This is confidential information. And guess who had Miami's playbook? That's right, Joe Auer. He never turned his playbook in and kept it with him when the Dolphins were set to play the Falcons in an interleague preseason game. Why the team never collected the playbook? My guess is that the Dolphins thought that Auer would stay on the team via the taxi squad. So there was no need to collect it and waste time. But when Auer's signed with the Falcons, all of a sudden, they needed the playbook back, as Auer was no longer a Dolphin. So what do you think Joe Auer did? Do you think he returned the playbook, said apologies for the misunderstanding, and wished everyone on Miami good luck in the future, thanking them for the opportunity over the last few years? Of course not. Of course he didn't. Because Joe Auer decided, hey, you know what would be a good idea? Let's blackmail the Dolphins for some money. Supposedly, Owl wasn't paid for the two exhibition games where he was injured and couldn't play after getting into that car accident where he had to swerve to avoid hitting an animal. At 250 bucks per game, 
that came out to $500 that Auer did not have with him, that the Dolphins, in his eyes, owed him. Now, you can argue whether or not this was a work-related injury, seeing as it was in a car and Auer had full control of the vehicle, but it was outside of the team facility. However, according to the AFL office, the Dolphins did not have to pay Auer because he was not hurt playing football. So in their eyes, it was not work-related at all. The point is that this man, Joe Auer, felt that he was being cheated out of a pretty hefty payday of roughly 4400 bucks in today's money. And he had a simple demand for the Dolphins. Give me my money, or I keep the playbook. Give me the $500 that I feel that I'm owed for the last two weeks, or I'm keeping this playbook with me. In other words, a classic textbook case of blackmail. And this man right here, head coach George Wilson, was understandably furious about this. He wanted to find Auer for insubordination and for not returning the playbook, but was reminded by a reporter that he couldn't do that, seeing as, you know, Auer was no longer a dolphin. To which Wilson replied, then I could have thrown him in jail for stealing. When asked about Auer and why he was cut from the team, even before all of this went down, he said, use your own judgment. Joe Auer is Joe Auer's own worst enemy. And Wilson was especially hurt about this because he was the one who gave Auer a chance to be on the Dolphins in the first place and was even calling up teams to see if anyone would take him on their squad, like the Falcons. Said Wilson, the thing that hurts me about this is that Auer wouldn't even have stayed in pro football after he got cut by the Rams three years ago if it wasn't for me. I helped Joe all the way. And to some extent, he's got a point. Auer was drafted by the Rams and the Chiefs in 1963, but never played it down for either of those teams. And in 1965, with the Buffalo Bills, he only touched the ball three times all season. George Wilson sort of saved his career. Coming to Miami and playing a huge role in that expansion team revitalized Joe Auer's career. And Wilson felt that Auer was betraying him by pulling this stunt on his way out, forgetting where he came from. As for what Auer's side had to say about the whole thing, eventually, the playbook was returned to the Dolphins, with his attorney, Julius Ursling, saying that the whole ordeal was ridiculous. Said Ursling, Mrs. Auer had the playbook at her home, and has so informed Coach Wilson, and has asked someone from the Dolphins to come and pick it up. At no point has the playbook been offered to the Atlanta Falcons. If Joe has any money coming, we will seek our remedy in the courts, not through holding the playbook for ransom. Translation, why would we hold this playbook for ransom? Why would we use this as blackmail, especially since the Falcons don't even play in the American Football League? So what good is this going to do us? It's like if Trevor Lawrence found the playbook to the Phoenix Suns next to him. Sure, he probably shouldn't have it. But what good is Lawrence having a playbook to a team he's never going to face in his life? Then again, Auer's response when his lawyer wasn't speaking for him was kind of hysterical. It started off with your usual bitterness, saying, It's hard to believe that Miami, a team on which I was MVP and where I hold all those records, and a team which I've sweated blood for, would do what it's done after my two years with them. And then, it devolves into a bizarre argument, saying, The playbook never left my dresser at home. Never. Why didn't I turn it in? Well, I was still a dolphin, and I felt I had a right to the playbook even after I came up here to Atlanta. I'm sorry, what? You had a right to the playbook? Even though you are no longer a member of the team? Are you crazy? How does that work? That has never happened ever. Can you imagine a world in which any time you play for a team, no matter how long, you get to keep the playbook? 
That's like saying that if I work as a costume character for Disney World, and I play Mickey Mouse, and I get fired, that I get to keep the Mickey costume, even though it's a work product. And even though having it out in a non-Disney related space can cause irreparable damage to the brand. That's not how this works. And that's never been how it worked. So Auer's argument is actually insane. So what happened with the money and the playbook? Well, this blackmail plan, shocker, did not work out at all. If you even want to call it a blackmail plan. The league said that we can still fine you for stealing the playbook. Even if the team might not be able to. And any money that you make in terms of payments from the Dolphins, we can just as easily take away from you with a fine. So when you combine that with the fact that the Dolphins did not have to owe our assent because this was a non-football related injury according to NFL rules, Auer's wife returned the playbook to the Dolphins and the momentary crisis was averted. But of all the players to exit the Dolphins, I don't think anyone's had a more dramatic and a more wild exit than Bauer. Just to recap, the man doesn't return his playbook, then keeps the playbook for blackmail purposes, then returns the playbook once he's informed that this is theft, that this violates league-wide policy across the NFL and the AFL, and that, oh yeah, blackmail is illegal. Even though Bauer might be best known for how he started his career, with the very first touchdown in Dolphins history on the opening kickoff, he deserves to be known for how he ended his career. Because when it came to this entire saga in 1968, it left a bunch of people saying about Bauer, Bauer, are you kidding me? Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.